Today we are going to talk about the literary devices that author Ken Liu uses in his short story, The Paper Menagerie. It's a really beautiful, incredibly written story that's won a lot of literary awards. Um, it's definitely worth a read and it's definitely worth several layers of examination. Um, we've previously examined this story through the lens of narrative elements, which are kind of the more structural artistic choices that a writer makes uh, to communicate their story. We're talking about setting, atmosphere, tone, plot construction and plot uh, diagram. And then we, we talk about kind of the character choices and character arcs uh, that the author will use to communicate their message. But there's a whole different part to writing and analyzing writing. And that is looking at, aside from the structural choices, I call those the narrative elements, um, there's little and overarching artistic choices that an author makes. And you can kind of think about it as kind of the special effects that an author will use to communicate their meaning um, and enhance the depth, complexity, and beauty of their writing and of their message and of, of the story itself. Um, so the word we use for these special effects, um, the term we use for these special effects is called a literary device. And it's really kind of the umbrella term for any type of special effect tool that an author uses to enhance their writing. This can be anything from how the writing sounds in your head or when it's spoken to how they they connect things in our world to enhance the meaning of of their writing. So there's there's several different kind of categories of literary devices and there's some kind of general literary devices but also there's what we call figurative language and that's any literary device that kind of takes the literal meaning away from what the actual words mean um, and, and puts those words into a figurative meaning, meaning it's di the, the actual meaning is different than the literal meaning of that combination of words. We'll talk more about that. But then there's also what we call a sound device. And they are those literary devices that enhance the sound of the writing as it is spoken or as it is kind of spoken in someone's head as they're reading. And then finally we have kind of an author can use the point of view, how the story is narrated, how the story is told. Um, they can use narrators and points of view to enhance their meaning. So we'll talk about all of that today. So first things first in terms of literary devices. Um, the first literary device that I see in the paper menagerie is hyperbole. It's often also called overstatement. And that's just when somebody says, oh, I walked a million miles today. That's just a purposeful uh, exaggeration to enhance meaning. So I saw there's, there's more than this in the story, but two specific instances that I think are interesting. When the mother is writing to her son, she talks about writing with all her heart. And we know that you can't ever put your whole heart onto paper or into words. Um, so that is an overstatement for her to say that she is writing with all her heart, but we know it's an idiom in our society. We know that when someone says they're doing something with all their heart, we know that that means they're just putting a ton of emotion and feeling and sincerity and honesty into it. Um, so when that's on page 74 of the story, but also in that letter that the mother writes to her son, she says that no one understood her and she understood nothing. And that's kind of an overstatement or you could classify it as an understatement as well. Um, we know that she used that phrase to communicate how lost and misunderstood she felt. But we know that she did understand quite a bit. She says she understood nothing, but what she really means is she couldn't quite get to the bottom of why she was being treated the way she was being treated but she understood quite a bit she was a smart woman 
Um, so that was a specific overstatement or understatement, depending on how you look at it. That's also um, in the story on page 75. So the next literary device that I see in here is called euphemism. And that is just anytime we use a fancy term to make something sound better, less scary, more beautiful. So for instance, it's when we say you're fired, someone will say, oh, I got let go. That's a euphemism. Um, or when we say correctional facility instead of prison, right? So it's anytime where you put a nicer spin on things. Um, so the euphemism that I, I found in this story that I found extremely informative is when Jack says that after he has consistently rejected his mother, um, said that he's not interested in anything she says in, in any language, uh, and ignores her and kind of detaches from her, he says that he is, by doing that rejecting, he's continuing his all-American pursuit of happiness. And that's a real euphemistic way to say that he's rejecting his mother in every way. Um, so saying, kind of putting a positive spin on what you're doing, that's a euphemism. And, and that is an important idea throughout the story. So when we use that euphemism, the, the author is kind of trying to communicate that this boy is rationalizing his behavior and putting an American spin on what is essentially rejecting his heritage and his family. So the next uh, literary device that I see is a colloquialism. And the key to remembering what this term is, is, is that there's the, the word local in there. And so we just think of any slang or, or combination of words that kind of it brings realistic speech or kind of how would somebody locally talk in a conversation? So there's a lot of colloquialisms, but you know, common ones are when people say I ain't or gonna or what's up or even a colloquialism um, around here is saying pop instead of soda. It's just something that local people would say, real local people would say. And so in this story, I found uh, just one, things, one thing on page 69 when the family's eating dinner. Um, Jack says, a lot of families cook Chinese sometimes. And if you're just looking at the literal meaning of these words, what does that mean, right? But we know that he's trying to convince his mother to cook American food and, and the father is saying a lot of families cook Chinese sometimes. So he's saying, we know what that means, but if somebody who didn't speak English would look at that, they'd be like, what do you mean? Are you cooking Chinese people? But really we just understand that it's cooking Chinese food, right? That was on page 69. And then the next sort of literary device that I want to talk about was called allusion. And people often get that confused with illusion, starting with an I, but illusion is just a, an indirect passing reference to something that the author is assuming that the reader already knows about. They don't stop to explain it or define it. They just reference it um, and it enhances the meaning of the scene. So there are a few allusions to this, like, you know, a really simple one is saran wrap. Um, we know what saran wrap is. We know it's plastic wrap, but saran is the actual brand name. And so we all know what he means when he says that. He doesn't need to stop and say saran wrap is a brand name of a plastic wrap that used to cover food. No, he just references it and moves on. That's a, a popular culture reference. Um, but the one that I think sticks out to me most in this story is the continual reference to Star Wars. And the author never stops to explain what Star Wars is or why it's important in American culture. Um, but Ken Liu is is a science fiction writer. So he certainly knows a lot about Star Wars, but this allusion to Star Wars isn't just in there for fun. It's an important juxtaposition, which we'll get to in a second. It's a really important representation of American popular culture. And Ken Leo brings it into the, into the story to really highlight the idea that Jack and his family are out of sync with American culture even right down to what toys and, and movies a real American kid, that's in air quotes, should like. 
Um, so these illusions aren't just there for show. They, they have a, a much more deeper meaning and impact on the story. Um, there weren't a ton of really glaring oxymorons in the story, but just for the sake of an example, on page 69, he says that he wants that, I think it was Mark, the friend said that he wanted to know where Jack's real toys are. And so when we put two words together that have contradicting meanings, like Biggie Smalls or Jumbo Shrimp or Pretty Ugly, um, it's similar real toys. Toys are specifically not real stuff. <laughs> That's kind of the point. So um, putting the word real and toys together kind of highlights the idea that Mark has unrealis unrealistic expectations of Jack in terms of his toys. And what makes a toy real? It's undefinable because toys are inherently not real. So by that definition, Jack's origami toys are also real or not real at the same time. His toys are just as valid as Mark's toys. So the idea of real toys is a bit of an oxymoron. It's not a, a super great example, but it, it is an example. The next uh, literary device we'll talk about is juxtaposition. And I just really like to say that word because it sounds cool. Um, but it's a super duper important tool that writers use. It's similar to a character foil that we talked about with our narrative terms. You know, character foils, an author will put two characters together to highlight the differences between them. Um, and that's the same with juxtaposition, except for it can be putting any two things together to highlight their differences. Um, and when you put two things together in a story or together when you're explaining it, it really helps solidify the characteristics of each separate thing. So for instance, really with those toys, Mark's toys are, you know, quote, air quotes, American. And uh, Jack's toys are decidedly Chinese. And those two toys put side by side or juxtaposed really highlight the differences. And those two differences just between the toys expands to a much greater meaning of highlighting the differences between their cultures, which is the whole point of Ken Liu putting those, that, writing that scene and putting those two types of toys together. Um, and it is the scene, that juxtaposition is really what causes Jack to begin to pull away from his culture, pull away from his mother, and pull away to, from what his mother's culture offers. So that juxtaposition, while it's just a simple thing, is kind of the crux of the entire story, truly. So juxtaposition can be very powerful. Um, next, the, uh, a motif, it's kind of an interesting term. A motif is a recurring image, sound, idea, anything that keeps reoccurring in the story. And it's not the same as a symbol, but it's anything that keeps recurring. Um, and it's, if you think about it, it's kind of hard to define, but if you're a musician, you know that a musical motif is something, is a musical idea or phrase that keeps popping up throughout the story. And it can even kind of change or morph its meaning over time as it pops up. So for instance, Hamilton's a great example of that. Anytime um, the characters say, this could be enough, this could be enough. And it happens about every four minutes in the story pretty regularly. But as they say, this could be enough, the enough, changes um, over time, but it is a motif because it's a reoccurring image. Um, the Aaron Burr, sir, right? That whole musical motif with the lyrics and the rhythm together, it happens in the very first few minutes of the show and kind of progresses until the ultimate uh, climax of the story when Aaron Burr and Hamilton face off. It's an important motif, that rhythm, just that line, the idea of Sir in there. So in this story, um, there's so many motifs, things that are continually mentioned, like, you know, speak English, speak English, speak English. And it's, it's a motif is used to kind of cue to the reader what is most prominently on the character's minds. Um, so a motif in this story that actually really becomes a symbol over time is the idea of the mother blowing into the toys to give them life, inflating them, and then the son continually 
deflating or taking her life, her breath out of those toys um, is a motif. It happens right from the beginning all the way through the end. And the motif, that motif, that repeated image or idea um, morphs over time and enhances the meaning of the story over time. So um, the next is ambiguity. When an author, when an author purposefully allows the reader to kind of decide on their own interpretation of something and the author doesn't specifically spell something out for the reader, it's an important idea. A lot of authors will leave an ending ambiguous. So the reader has to kind of interpret what happened or imagine what happened based on their own interpretation. And I think one beautiful sense of ambiguity in this story is that we are never told whether or not the magic of these origami animals coming to life, we're never told whether it's, we're supposed to consider it real or not. And I think that that's important. I think that the story would change a lot if Ken Liu, it just like insisted that these animals were 100% real. And I think it would also change the story a lot if Ken Liu insisted that we understood that all of these animals coming to life was, was in Jack's mind. It would change the story, but by leaving it ambiguous, it almost enhances the ability for the reader to take what they need from the story. Not giving a reader an answer is a very powerful writer's choice. So ambiguity can be really important. Next, we just, the, using adjectives, descriptive words is a really simple writer's tool, but it, 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 when done right, it could be truly beautiful. So when we talked about, uh, on page 73, Jack talks about uh, Lao Hu, the tiger, jumping up. He doesn't just say the tiger jumped up. He said the tiger jumped with feline grace. And just using those descriptive words, feline grace, we automatically cue an idea into our mind that wouldn't have been there had we not used adjectives. So adjectives are just a simple way to enhance the beauty and understanding in a piece. Um, next is diction. And it's really just a fancy word for saying careful word choices made by the author. Um, careful word choices can enhance the meaning just like an adjective would, right? So I thought a really beautiful example of diction in this story was on page 65. And I just thought it was so lovely for so many reasons. But I mean, it's a very, this line that I'm going to read has a, a lot of euphony, which is beautiful sounds, but also the specific words chosen um, are gorgeous. And the specific combination of words in this order. Um, is touching. It like touches your soul here. So this line on page 65, it says, she breathed into them so that they shared her breath and thus moved with her life. There's a lot of less gorgeous ways of saying that, but this sentence is so beautiful and the beauty of the sentence, the beauty of that word choice um, just enhances the visual that the reader gets in their mind, but also just the overall impact of the story. Um, the next, it kind of goes hand in hand with diction is syntax. And so if diction is specific word choice, syntax is the author's way of putting words together in beautiful combinations. That's really just it. And so you could, the sentence I just read could also be a great example of syntax. But um, another great example of syntax here is using what we call parallel structure. We won't talk much about it, but parallel structure means kind of having parts of a sentence mirror other parts of a sentence. And so the parallel structure in this syntax or in the way that the author puts this together, um, the sum of the individual words in the sentence is greater than its separate parts is really what syntax is. So syntax here on page 75, it's when the mom says, no one understood me and I understood nothing. It's such a beautiful sentence, but it honestly sums up everything she has to say about her life. Um, so that syntax or the way that the author constructed that sentence is just beautiful. So soliloquy, the, the word soliloquy is hard to pronounce, but it's really just a word to describe oftentimes in a play um, when, a, when a character 
talks for a long time is a fancy way of saying it, but it's as if they're speaking their thoughts aloud, regardless of who's listening. There's a ton in Shakespeare stuff. And if you've seen Dear Evan Hansen, there's the song Waving Through a Window is a musical soliloquy. But in this story, um, the mother's letter is a form of a soliloquy because she's kind of pouring her heart out and speaking her thoughts regardless of who's hearing. She doesn't even know if her son is going to read this. Uh, but this, since this soliloquy is written down, we call it an epistolary soliloquy, which epistolary is a fancy word of just saying a letter. Um, so this soliloquy is just, just a way for her to communicate her thoughts in a big chunk is really a fancy way. The soliloquy is a fancy way of saying that. Um, so in medias res, we learn, we use a lot of Latin terms in, uh, literature to describe things but in medias res is the direct translation for that is into the middle of things and so basically it's exposition or the author giving you more information about the basics of the story they don't do the exposition in the beginning like most stories do it starts the story and then kind of interrupts it with uh more important information uh, expositional information kind of in the middle of the story through flashbacks, through dialogues or descriptions of past events. So a good example of in medias res is when the chronological story of Jack's life is interrupted when he stops the action of the story and talks about how his parents met and got married. That's a perfect example of in medias res. Um, um, then we have shift and it's such a small idea but honestly, shifts in writing, in poetry, in music, the meaning comes out of shifts. That's just, if you can find a shift in a piece of writing, you can find the meaning. I mean, it's such a powerful idea. So basically what I mean by shift is when a writing, when a writer kind of has a pattern of storytelling or structure or tone, um, in their story or in their poem or, or whatever they're writing, when they, they've established a, a pattern and they break that pattern, there's a major shift. Um, and it can be in everything that's written down, in, in speeches, novels, poems, songs, whatever. But shifts are just major, major, major. Uh, if you, again, if you can find the shift, you can find the meaning. That's just the bottom line. But something that's beautiful about the shifts in this story is the shifts. Uh, mirror the son's relationship with his mother. Um, so we have the story from the son's point of view, talking about how he's judging his mother, how he doesn't want to communicate with her, and then we shift narrators. We shift narrators right at the end to the mother speaking for herself finally. And that shift is a huge, huge flag. The author is saying, you've had the Jack's idea of all of this now we're going to completely shift to a totally different storytelling paradigm and let the mother speak for herself. And that shift also mirrors the shift in Jack's mind of his idea of his mother and his culture and her feelings for him. Also, um, the shift of, of how Jack treats the animals is a real interesting signifying for how Jack treats his mother. So at first he's totally enamored with these animals. He thinks they're incredible. Um, but once he gets older, he shifts from loving them to being embarrassed of them and then imprisoning them in a shoebox under his bed uh, to totally ignoring them when his mom makes new ones. And then he shifts there um, as an adult when his girlfriend sees them in a different light and a different point of view, he shifts to starting to appreciate them again. And the final most beautiful shift is he unfolds them, understands his mother more, and we find the very last line, him actually refolding and creating origami and continuing his mother's legacy. So those shifts really show the shifts, the shifts in how he treats those animals also are the shifts in how he sees his mother. So it's extremely, extremely informative. Anytime there's a shift or a break in pattern in any way, um, there's the, there's your meaning. And I know it seems silly, but uh, repetition in this story is a really powerful tool. 
So when we talk about repetition in any way, um, anything that is repeated, obviously, just like in the chorus of a song, um, anything that's repeated is obviously really important and the author really, really wants you to remember and understand that. Um, so we'll talk about a little uh, repetition going forward too. So the next group of literary devices is figurative language. And again, we define figurative language as a type of literary device, but it uses language in a non-literal way to suggest beautiful images or heighten effect. So I, uh, ideas of figurative language terms are like personification, symbolism, simile, metaphor, anything that takes the literal meaning of words and flips it on its head, right? So um, for, we have an idiom here, which is similar to a colloquialism, but an idiom is just a common phrase or expression that has acquired a different meaning over time. Like it's raining cats and dogs. We all know that it's not literally having dogs and cats fall from the sky, but it's an idiom knowing that we all know the figurative meaning of it and nobody needs to explain it. We know it's raining cats and dogs means it's raining really hard outside. Um, so in the story, uh, the use of the word, I, I hesitate to say it because it is a racial slur and it's extremely disrespectful, but unfortunately racial slurs um, are a type of idiom. So the word, um, I, I just hesitate to say this, but the word chink, C-H-I-N-K, really means like a chink or a hole in armor or a hole in something, like an offense, but we in our culture have appropriated, reappropriated the meaning of that word to mean a racial slur against anyone who is of Asian descent. It's extremely disrespectful, but racial slurs like that are a term of idiom. It's a common word or expression that has acquired a different meaning from its literal meaning. And uh, unfortunately, we all know what that means. It's upsetting, but knowing that idea of an idiom is incredibly important to understanding this story. The boy asks his mom if he has uh, insert that word here, that type of face. And that really instigates the entire assimilation conversation that they have at the dinner table. Another idiom that's a lot less offensive is um, when Jack goes to see his mom and he says, my mind was not in the room. That was on page 71. We know that his literal mind, his brain was inside his head, inside the room. So that's the literal meaning of what he said, but we know figuratively, or aside from the literal meaning, he means that his thoughts were not present. He wasn't uh, mentally present in the situation. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of an idiom. One of the most beautiful uses of literary devices, especially figurative language in this story, is the idea of personification. And it's at the heart of the meaning of the story. So a personification is when we, Inanimate objects, things that are not alive, we give them alive or human qualities. That's just the bottom line, but we do it all the time, right? Snowflakes are happily dancing in the sky. Snowflakes don't dance. We just gave it an alive quality that it doesn't actually have, but it's important in descriptive terms. But when throughout the whole entire story, we see these inanimate objects, these unalive folded pieces of paper, turn into something magical, alive, interactive, they're speaking, they're relating, they have emotions. Um, and that goes to the heart of the ambiguity of the story. Ken Liu wants you to see these beautiful pieces of origami through a child's eyes, but he also wants you to ask, is there real magic here? He wants you to ask and decide for yourself. Either answer is fine, as long as you have thought through um, the characters enough to make a decision for yourself. So personification, it's just a, gore, it's a gorgeous use of personification in this story. So next we have symbolism and people get symbolism and a metaphor confused, but just think symbolism is a thing that stands for or represents something else. So the simplest idea here is single ladies when Beyonce says, if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it. That ring doesn't just symbolize a piece of jewelry. What she's saying is, you should have married me. So the ring symbolizes or stands in for a bigger idea, marriage, commitment, long-term love, right? So in that sense, symbolism, really these origami animals stand in or represent uh, 
his mother, Jack's mother, her hope in her son, her effort that she puts into their relationship. She literally breathes life into these uh, paper creations. And as she breathes life into it, um, it connects with her son, it entertains and brings happiness to her son. And when her son rejects those toys, he rejects his mother. When her son finally understands and accepts those pieces of origami, he finally understands and accepts the love of his mother and his mother's culture. So the symbolism in this story is quite beautiful. So we have simile and metaphor, and you've probably heard before that a simile is a comparison between two unlike things that are fundamentally dissimilar. Um, so, but, but for simile, you use the words like or as in the comparison. So when Miley Cyrus says, I came in like a wrecking ball, that's a simile because she used the word like, right? Or you could say as soft as a cloud. You're using the word as in there, that's a simile. But if you take those like and as out, and if Miley Cyrus were to say, I am a wrecking ball, that's a metaphor. Because you're not using like or as, or you could say this pillow is a cloud. They're two unlike things, and you're just stating that they're like without using like or as. Um, so in the story, we have a simile. I, I was only able to see one. It's when on page 65, after Jack starts really rejecting his mother, he said, teenagers love to feel contempt or enmity or dislike. And he says the line, contempt felt good like wine. So he's saying that the contempt he felt for his mother made him feel good. It almost had an intoxicating effect like wine would. So there's your sim simile. And then a metaphor. This isn't a super strong example of a metaphor, but it's the only one I could find in this story on page 67. The white neighborhood people say that Jack is a little monster. And they mean that his facial features seem so foreign to them that he looks incomplete as a person, which is a horrifying thing to say. Um, but when they say he's a little monster, they're comparing this beautiful little boy to a monster just to highlight their uh, xenophobia and their discomfort with his, big air quotes, un-American features in their eyes. But that metaphor really truly highlights the quiet racism that those neighbors had against uh, Jack and his mother and his family and also the quiet unspoken expectations that, that we sometimes have what makes somebody American, um, which is really, really sad. Um, there wasn't really a strong use of, oh, before we get there, the idea of an extended metaphor. So we have a metaphor where we're saying, you know, life is a highway, uh, this little boy is a little monster. An extended metaphor is when you take that metaphor and expand it throughout your storytelling. So a good example of that is Rihanna's song, Umbrella. She uses umbrella and images of rain and covering someone as not just a one-time metaphor in one sentence, but throughout the whole song, it's an extended metaphor for um, being there for someone, supporting them, and all the other imagery around that one metaphor extends throughout the entire work. So in this story, this origami, again, it's, also, it's a symbol, but it's also an extended metaphor. So the creation of the origami represents the love and culture of Jack's mother. When it's inflated, deflated, tucked away, or appreciated, it represents Jack's rejection or acceptance of his mother and her culture. And then there wasn't much irony in this story, except for we know there's three types of irony. There's verbal irony where you say something but mean the opposite. It's like sarcasm is one form of that. Um, and and uh, situational irony when the result of the situation is totally different from what you'd expect. But there is an example of a dramatic irony, which is a special kind of irony where it's the readers know something that the characters don't. And that's where the, the irony comes out. So um, for example, there's a lot of dramatic irony in the song Rehab by Amy Winehouse, because she's not aware when we're listening to the recording that she will eventually pass away from a drug overdose. So 
when we listen to that song now, there's a lot of dramatic irony because we as the audience understand important things that the, that the character doesn't. So that's, a, a, that's an example of dramatic irony. But here, um, remember how Jack really despised his mother for lying and uh, lying to basically get purchased as a wife by an American man. Um, he, he just thought that that was, he was disgusted by that. Um, and he just he lost a lot of respect for his mother when he found out that that's how his parents met and married. But the, the really interesting thing is that he despised everything about his mother and disrespected her for that. But when he grows up and he, he's applying for colleges, he literally says that he strategically thinking up lies um, to sell himself to these universities. And without really understanding it, he has become what he despised in his mother, just in a different, more Americanly acceptable form. Um, he is lying and selling himself just as his mother did, but you could argue that it's in a more dishonest way than his mother because she was essentially forced into that situation and he did it of his own volition. So there is a lot of dramatic, uh, a lot of dramatic irony in that. And it's kind of sad. Um, when we go on to sound devices, so these are devices that when read or when heard um, in your mind as you're reading, they create a beautiful musical effect. So we know sound devices are like what makes the words musical to hear. Um, so alliteration, there's other words here like assonance and consonance uh, that we're not going to go into in this class, but alliteration is just the repetition, repetition of the same letter or sound at the beginning of closely connected words in a sentence. So um, in Cheryl Crow's Big Yellow Taxi song, they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. That's alliteration and it, it, it brings a rhythm and a beauty to the sound. Um, but on page 66 of the Paper Menagerie, uh, he talks about one of his origami friends getting its legs wet um, in soy sauce. And he says that these that the animal had sauce softened legs, which is just a really beautiful use of alliteration. It's only two repeated sounds, but sauce softened legs is, is such a beautiful sound and it kind of enhances the, the, our understanding of his love and admiration for this animal. And then another great one is on page 75 when Jack's mom is talking about uh, how she found a better life for herself. And she says on page 75, she says, if I can learn how to, if I can cook, clean, and take care of a husband, I'll have a nice life, basically. And this whole idea of can cook, clean, and take care, these repeated sounds um, kind of bring a rhythm to the sentence, but, and the rhythm almost highlights the constancy and pattern of what some would deem as air quotes again women's work and how it's never done and there's a pattern and the rhythm to it that has to be repeated and it's monotonous so those repeated sounds can really enhance the meaning there um, so there's cacophony and euphony cacophony and euphony and they're kind of two juxtaposed terms two opposite terms cacophony is a combination of words with rough aggressive percussive or unharmonious sounds that are used for a noisy or jarring sound effect. Um, so it's the opposite of what we call euphony, but it's when you're using repeated hard comp consonant sounds that kind of sound like drum beats or percussion. Um, so the b, p, k, t, g, like really guttural, uh, aggressive consonant sounds. Um, so one interesting use of that is when Mark on page 68 says, here's your stupid cheap Chinese garbage. And the sound of that sentence really mirrors the contempt that Mark is feeling for Jack and his toys. And so just the cacophony of those sounds in that sentence really heightens the emotional effect of that scene. Um, and to the opposite of that, euphony is just a combination of soft, beautiful melodious sounds in a group of words so we're using a lot a lot of soft letter sounds like ooh, mm, eh, ah, oh, mm, right it's just kind of like think of 
sounds that would be in a lullaby. And so there's a, there's a lot of euphony in this, but the one that I wanted to highlight that I think is so beautiful is the thing that brings Jack the most comfort in this story is his origami tiger. And his origami tiger's name is Lauhu. And every sound in that word is soft and soothing. And so it's just that name of that toy, that animal, is euphony. Just the sound of lahu is so uh, melodious and pleasing to the ear that it really does mirror the calming and the comforting effect that this beautiful toy that his mother made has on Jack and has not only in the beginning of the story, but in the final uh, closure of the story, Lauhu, he refolds Lauhu and finds comfort in the loss of his mother in this animal. So just the euphony of that name is uh, really informative. So then we have another sound device, just onomatopoeia, which is a fun word to say, um, and it's a perfect word for what it is. It's just words that are created from the sound that they make. So that's zip, boom, buzz, crash, bang. Um, in Katy Perry's song, Firework, she talks about, she's saying boom, 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 even brighter than the moon, moon, moon. Um, she's using onomatopoeia to enhance her message. And so in this same story, uh, when Lahu, uh, Ken Liu actually writes what Lahu says into the in words, and he says, Rarutha. And if you think it, it's just such a beautiful onomatopoeia, these are words that are that are created from the sound they make, and it really gives this inanimate object personified piece of paper a voice. Um, but also the word snarls, when Mark snarls at uh, Jack, just the word snarls sounds like what it is, like a snarl. So that's another great onomatopoeia. Again, we talk about repetition of sound and repetition of ideas as meaningful in works. So the repetition in this story, there's so much, but I think the most beautiful repetition and informative repetition in this story is the when somebody tells Jack's mother to speak English, speak English, speak English, it is throughout the story, it's repeated at least six times, um, if not more. Um, and it's just the repetition of it reinforces the pressure that Jack's mother feels to assimilate and reinforces her feeling of failure when she doesn't, in her eyes, do a good job of being a, you know, clear cut, air quotes, American. Um, and this whole idea of speak English, speak English uh, really speaks to one of the main ideas of this story that that is the pressure to be whatever somebody decides or defines as being American, being truly American. So that repetition is really powerful. So finally, when we get to narrators and points of view, uh, an author can really communicate um, the artistry and beauty of a story based on who they select as a narrator and what kind of narrator they are and what kind of point of view the narrator has. Um, but what I think is really interesting, not just in terms of narrator, um, but point of view just from different characters' points of view um, is really interesting here. So we see throughout the story that Jack, as he gets older, starts to kind of despise his mother's origami, starts to ignore it, deflate it, hide it, ignore, just, just put it in a shoebox under the bed. And it isn't until Jack's girlfriend says that your mother is an amazing artist. These pieces of origami are beautiful and she puts them around the house as decoration. And her perspective, her point of view on his mother's origami changes Jack's point of view. So it's really powerful. Jack starts to shift his perception of this origami from being trash to being a beautiful artistic piece of work. Um, and it's the girlfriend's point of view that changes Jack's point of view, or at least starts to change it. And then in terms of point of view, the shift in the narrator at the end, we, we hear everything from Jack's side, and then we finally hear from Jack's mother's per point of view, and it changes the entire story that shift in point of view changes everything. So when we talk about what type of narrator Jack is, um, if we're asking whether it's first, second, or third person, um, we're looking at a first person 
narrator because Jack is saying, I, me, I, me. And even when the narration switches to his mother's perspective, it's still first person. She is saying things from her, her, her perspective. Um, but what's interesting when we talk about narrators is whether a narrator is reliable and or whether a narrator has bias. And that's really important in this story because bias means like they're they're adding their own spin, their own point of view on what's happening. So if this were a third person narrator, the narrator could is removed from the action and can tell you what's going on from kind of like an onlooker's point of view. But because it's Jack's perspective, we get his bias on things as he starts to get older. We get his disrespect of his mother, his non-acceptance of his mother and so we start to maybe see his mother through jack's eyes and that's maybe not a, not a fair representation of her so there is a bit of bias in jack's storytelling and then when we hear from jack's mother we hear her bias um how she sees the situation and it's very um subjective from each of their points of view, completely different takes on the same events. And that's an important author choice. The author is using those separate narrative narrator biases to highlight the misunderstandings between these two characters. It's, it's a very powerful author's choice. Um, but the final, final question here is, is this narrator, is Jack a reliable narrator? And I mean this in several senses, is his bias against his mother causing the reader to also misunderstand his mother? And I, I would venture yes for a little while until we hear from his mother. So he, Jack is, is what we would call a, a kind of unreliable narrator. But the most beautiful thing again is on page 72 when the line that says, the memory of children cannot be trusted. So when we know Jack is remembering the magic that uh, his mother kind of breathed into these pieces of origami, the author is basically saying, you know, you might not be able to trust that this narrator was telling you the truth. Maybe all of these alive animals were just a figment of his imagination, but we also do get a hint later in the story that uh, Jack's mother came from a village that was known for its magical origami. It's actually like uh, animated origami and this origami would fly and have magic. So whether or not this is a, just a story or a fun fantasy is left up to the reader. And so Ken Liu uh, intentionally establishes an unreliability about that, which kind of enhances the beauty of the story. So when we talk about literary devices, we don't just talk about them just to have a fun intellectual exercise with a piece of writing. There's always a purpose in identifying the use of literary devices in writing. And that purpose is to help us understand the true overarching meaning of the story. So for instance, you know, the origami as a symbol of his mother's love and culture um, really helps. We, we go on a journey with, with Jack's feelings about this origami over time. We understand that he first is accepting and then skeptical and then completely rejecting and then finally accepting again. And his relationship with this symbolic origami is his relationship with his mother. And when we talk about the overarching theme, um, there's so many overarching themes to this story, but the idea that the danger, there is danger in not seeing life from the from somebody else's perspective, not seeing a situation from somebody else's perspective and the danger of disrespecting or devaluing who they are, devaluing their love, devaluing their culture can break down relationships, break down communication and can cause true and deep regret and sadness that can't be undone. So the danger in that single story. And then also when we talk about just the repetition of speak English, speak English, and uh, the metaphor of, of people in Jack's community seeing him as a monster, as almost an alien that doesn't belong, the desperation to assimilate into what we call American um, is really highlighted by these literary devices. And when we talk about the theme of the story that really truly 
his mother, Jack's mother, was American the whole time simply by virtue of being a citizen of America. And there's no definition of what American really is. There's no true definition of what love really looks like. Um, and there, when you try to narrowly define something, again, there's danger and regret and sadness and lost opportunities for love and connection. When you try to narrowly define something like love, something like what a mother should be, something like what language you should speak or what culture you should highlight or what it is to be American. Um, so hopefully this study of literary devices has helped expand your idea of, of what's possible when you're analyzing a story. Um, yeah, thank you, Ken Liu, for, for bringing us such a beautiful story to analyze. Um, I hope you learned a little bit and I hope you have gained a new appreciation for the amazing tools that literary devices are. Have a great day. Bye.